I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Antonio Baines. Uh, Dr. Baines has been uh, a staunch supporter of the uh, P20. Uh, we had a very large NIH uh, grant uh, from 2015 to 2019, and he was uh, a member of the uh, External Advisory Committee. He came here every year and gave advice to the, uh, to the grant. Uh, and after the, uh, you know, the grant uh, was over, he continued to work with us in this conference and he came every year to uh, participate in this series. So we're really very thankful to you for your time. Uh, he's Associate Professor of, of Pharmacology in the Department of Biological and uh, Biomedical Sciences at North Carolina Central University. So he'll be uh, moderating this session, so please uh, welcome him to the podium. Good morning, everybody. Uh, here in person and also uh, those that are watching virtually. Um, glad to be here. I'm actually very happy to be here. I've been here, as Dr. Sullivan said, for uh, quite a few years, and I'm always honored to either give a talk or moderate a session involving pancreatic cancer. So um, this morning we have two great speakers, two great speakers. Uh, first one up is Dr. Charles, Dr. F. Charles Bunicardi, um, MD. Uh, he is a senior vice president and Dean of the College of Medicine here at, at uh, SUNY Downstate. So a very important person, very important person. Um, just a couple of things very quickly. Um, he, uh, did, had an under, he has an undergraduate degree in chemistry um, with honors from John Hopkins University. Uh, he has an MD from Rutgers University School of Medicine. Um, did a residency uh, in general surgery at SUNY Downstate. Did a fellowship in pancreatic physiology. Um, and the laboratory, Dr. Dana K. Anderson, um, you know, again, has a whole list of, of, of achievements. Um, he's been on faculty and in, in various administrative positions uh, at three different medical schools, I think uh, Baylor, University of, Tal uh, uh, University of Toledo, and UCLA. Um, he's the editor-in-chief editor of Schwartz Principles, oh, sorry, Schwartz Principles of Surgery. Um, which, I, you know, which is the world's leading surgical textbook since 2000. So um, he's very heavily involved in that. And um, his research focuses on genomic translational medicine and targeted therapy, specifically in pancreatic cancer, um, but also um, as it relates to disparities of health. Um, and so without any further ado, um, I welcome Dr. Charles Bunicardi to the stage to talk about pancreatic cancer, with his topic being precision therapy for pancreatic cancer. Let's give him a hand. Thank you for that kind introduction. I'd like to thank Dr. Salafu for inviting me to give this lecture this morning. This lecture began 40 years ago, uh, and it represents the last uh, nine years of work from my laboratory. Uh, before I begin, uh, my conflict of interests are my wife and I have two virtual startups. One is Whispergenics for cancer therapy, and the other is Luminescence for imaging. I'd like to dedicate the talk today to my mentor, Dr. Dana K. Anderson. I trained in general surgery at Downstate in the 80s, and I spent three years in his lab studying pancreatic physiology. And so he taught me to be a surgeon scientist. And so the work that I'm presenting today actually started in 1983 in his laboratory. So the hypothesis is could we find a combination of generic drugs that can target actionable genes for pancreatic cancer and thus close the gap of health, cancer health disparities? Our problem is most of our therapies now have to be done in big centers and people don't have access to those centers. They're incredibly expensive. My father-in-law's on an immunotherapy, it's $17,000 for every single infusion he gets every other week. And so it's like, how can we treat people around the world that don't have access uh, to those type of healthcare facilities and treatments? So I'll take you on a journey over the last 155 years um, humans have been on Earth uh, for seven million years. Civilization is probably about 100,000 years old, so it's a very short time uh, for the human race. The golden era of medicine is uh, from 1845 to the year 2000, and then this century we, we've entered the era of precision medicine. 
It's using genomic information like Dr. Stadler was presenting and how to translate it into treatments. And that's the journey I'm going to take you on this morning. So if we go back to the 1860s, a monk who came from a farming family did uh, 30,000 experiments in pea plants. And he found that there was some type of genetics going on. Now he was a monk, so he wrote a paper and then no one paid attention to it until someone discovered, a scientist discovered genetics and they found his paper, so it's called Mendelian Genetics. At about the same time, a scientist, Friedrich Miescher, was working with pus and he found the stringy substance and he isolated it's the discovery of DNA. So now you flash forward, uh, usually in 50 year blocks, and you get to the discovery of DNA in 1953. And on your left uh, is Dr. Watson, who was from Chicago and Indiana, and he specifically went to Cambridge to work with the next gentleman, uh, Dr. Crick. And then they collaborated with Dr. Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin, Dr. Rosalind Franklin. And he gave them her x-ray crystallography, which looked like a spiral. And so they put it together and they discovered uh, DNA. Now, the three gentlemen on your left got the Nobel Prize. Rosalind Franklin should have been on that, but she passed away from ovarian cancer at a very young age before the Nobel Prize was awarded. So perhaps if we had genomic information and better treatment, she would have survived and won the Nobel Prize. Now we flash forward another 50 years, so to speak, and we have the Human Genome Project in the year 2000, one of the greatest accomplishments in the history of humanity. And the sequencing took 10 years and cost $3 billion. So you think about that, to sequence the human genome, one of the greatest accomplishments in science. Then you flash forward another seven years, and uh, they sequenced James Watson's entire DNA using 454 pyro sequencing, and it took two months and cost $1 million. So that represents a 10,000-fold uh, decrease in cost and a 10,000-fold increase in speed of sequencing. So it's a remarkable um, accomplishment, and that's James Watson from the other picture who discovered DNA in 1953. So the Human Genome Project is one of the most incredible projects in science. Um, it's just exponential progress of sequencing. We can now sequence someone for somewhere between $1,000 and $2,000. But Francis Collins said that it is fair to say that the Human Genome Project has not yet directly affected the health care of most individuals. So the challenge for the students and residents, our learners, is how do we link genomic information with patient care? So I like to show this slide. So we have on, this is the Grand Canyon, and on one side of the Grand Canyon is genomic sequencing, and the other side is clinical cares. So it's important for us to be able to build bridges between that information and affecting clinical care. So the journey I'm about to take you on is, is my laboratory's effort uh, to create a clinical care treatment from genomic information. Now, <clears throat> the only effective treatment today for uh, pancreatic cancer is the Whipple operation. So it's a pancreatic oduodenectomy, uh, and it was first published by Alan Oldfather Whipple in 1935. And you think about that, that's before antibiotics and, and before blood transfusions. So it was a technical tour de force. Now this is interesting. He, he operated on 37 patients, but one third of them died. That would not be allowed anymore. The hospitals would completely shut you down after a death or two. So it is a remarkable accomplishment. So the way the Whipple works, it usually takes a minimum of four hours, is this is the pancreatic cancer in the head. And so what you have to do is disconnect the stomach from the small intestine. You have to disconnect the small intestine here and then divide the pancreas. This, this back here is the body and tail. This is the head with the tumor. And then you have to take the bile duct and gallbladder as well. 
So that usually takes about minimum two hours, and then you reconstruct. So you, you attach the small, you take this part of the small intestine and you connect it to the bile duct. You then connect the intestine to the pancreas and then you connect the intestine to the stomach. And so that's called the Whipple operation. So here's a study from 2007. Um, the patient, about studying nearly 10,000 patients, those that had surgery had a better survival than those that could not have surgery. So it still is a very low survival, whether you have surgery or not, but certainly the majority of patients cannot have surgery. It's already spread. And so the survival rate, the five-year survival rate, is one of the worst cancers uh, that we know of. Now, we do know, as Dr. Sadler had shown us some very interesting genomic information, we do know that, that uh, pancreatic cancer goes from normal duct cells it starts transforming into what's called panin 1A, panin 1B, and then when it gets to panin 3, now we have its pre-malignant, and it turns into, frankly, invasive cancer. And so we have, uh, you know, one of the most famous drivers is KRAS. Uh, we have P53. So these are some of the genes that are associated with pancreatic cancer. So what we did, we were looking for a target and so what we did was called an RNA sequencing analysis of the human pancreatic cancer versus the normal pancreas in the same patient. So it was a, a human pancreatic cancer versus paired benign pancreatic tissue. And so this is a form of genomic sequencing called RNA sequencing. And what we discovered, we put all that information, this is like, I don't know, 75,000 data points, we put it into a UCLA program called Weighted Gene Co-Expression Analysis, and what we found out is that BRCA5 is a target for pancreatic cancer. Now, we know that BRCA5 is overexpressed in the majority of cancers, and there are a few papers showing that BRCA5 is overexpressed more in black patients with breast cancer uh, than in Caucasian patients. So what we did in the lab is we took normal pancreatic ductal organoids. Uh, the, these came from human pancreas specimens. And then we applied what's called CRISPR-Cas genetic engineering to those cells. And we implanted the, the, the driver KRAS G12D, and we knocked out P53. And so down on the bottom, you can see the, the, these beautiful benign organoids growing. So these are pancreatic organoids growing. The ones that have had the KRAS G12D and the P53, they very quickly start turning into pancreatic cancer. I love this slide. This is a single normal um, pancreatic organoid that is just starting to transform into pancreatic cancer. So we would call this a panin 3. It's a precancer. And you can see that the uh, the the KRAS G12D is being expressed in this organoid that's turning into cancer. Then when you take it to pathology and you start slicing it up, you can see that the transformed organoids look like pancreatic cancer. And this would be the normal wild type organoid that, that's beautifully lined ductal cells. And this slide shows you in the transformed organoids that we were overexpressing KRAS G12D compared to the wild type, and that we had knocked out P53 compared to P53 expression in the wild type. And then remarkably, our transformed organoids markedly overexpressed BRCA5, which is our target, whereas the wild type had no expression of BRCA5. We then took human pancreatic cancer specimens from the operating room, and we saw that BRCA5 was markedly overexpressed in human pancreatic cancer, which is similar to a lot of the other papers on BRCA5, and that it's even overexpressed in human panin 3, the precancer. So we think it's an early target uh, for pancreatic cancer. And you can see that uh, in the, the BRCA5 expression in the wild type was nothing. We then, if you had the KRAS G12D alone, you had a little bit of expression, but if you had G12D and you knocked out P53, you had marked overexpression of BRCA5, which was similar to MIAPACA2, which is a pancreatic cancer cell line. 
So, in summary of this part of the talk, uh, we, we, we had these driver mutations, KRAS G12D and a P53 knockout, resulted in transformed pancreatic ductal organoids leading to BRK5 overexpression. We then found that BRK5 was overexpressed in a series of PANIN3, the precancer, and pancreatic cancer specimens taken from the operating room. Uh, and these data support the hypothesis that BRK5 is a therapeutic target for pancreatic cancer. So now we have some genomic information. We have a gene, and we're, we, we're now going to try to figure out how we transform that into a treatment. So my lab had long been using uh, super promoters, which is the beginning of a gene, to drive gene therapy as well as RNAi therapy. And the problem is we were curing mice of human pancreatic cancer with those gene therapies. The problem is translating them was, I found, to be nearly impossible. Um, so what we did is we built a BRK5 super promoter. So the promoter on a gene is like the ignition of a car. So the ignition turns on the engine, which is the actual gene. So we created a super ignition by pulling out these boxes from the promoter, and they're all the stimulatory boxes, and we put, it, we put them together in a super promoter. We then tested the super promoter, and you can see the regular promoter of the gene gives this much expression of what we call Gaussian luciferase. It's luciferase is what's in fireflies. So the ubiquitous promoter is called CMV promoter, and you can see how much greater that expression is than the endogenous promoter. But then look at the super promoter, holy cow. And these are all pancreatic cancer cell lines. So we got tremendous expression from our super promoter. And these are benign cells, and you can see that the super promoter had no effect on the benign pancreatic cancer cells. So then what we did is we took our super promoter, hooked it up to luciferase, which is what, fi what makes fireflies glow, and we, put, um, we took human pancreatic cancer cells, so we took our super promoter, the ignition, driving luciferase, which is the gene, the luciferase, we swapped out the BRK5 gene for the luciferase gene, and we dropped it into the human pancreatic cancer cells, now, these are the keys that turn on the ignition. These are called um, transcription factors. So these transcription factors turn on the BRK5 promoter, which in turn turns on the gene luciferase. So it gives off luciferase protein, and then that uh, creates light. And you can see which cells are expressing the light. So we then did, by accident, an FDA-approved drug library. I initially wanted a, um, a library of novel drugs so we could find a novel drugs, but the core at UCLA ran an FDA-approved drug library screening. And I was like, why, why'd you do that? He said, I don't know, I thought it'd be interesting. So I went home and talked about it with my wife. Uh, we're partners on all this work. And she says, she had the foresight to say, this is very interesting. Maybe we can find uh, combinations of inexpensive generic drugs that would work. So, for the, so all of these drugs here, all of these green dots, are drugs that FDA approved drugs that are suppressing our BRK5 super promoter. So we spent the next year testing combinations of drugs uh, from one drug to five drugs that would work to uh, give us um, suppression of pancreatic cancer cells. And what my wife and I settled on was we picked three common drugs, simvastatin, metformin, and digoxin, for the following reasons. They're safe and relatively non-toxic oral medications. We were hoping that we wouldn't need chemotherapy. Uh, the drugs are all off-patent, generic, and inexpensive. With Dr. Salafu, we just calculated that the cost for one year of treatment for a single patient is $340. Remember, my father-in-law's infusions is 17,000 every other week. So for one year of treatment, taking these pills every day, it's $340. The drugs are relatively easy to manufacture and to distribute. 
So you could manufacture these anywhere in the world and distribute them to patients all over the world. There are three pills that they would take each day. We know that the patients are already taking the combination with known toxicity, and I will get to that towards the end. Uh, we have a lot of um, molecular mechanisms showing that each drug targets separate pathways, but they're all anti-metabolism drugs. And so what we think is that these three drugs turn off the light switch, uh, the flow of electrons in the cancer cells. Each, each of these drugs, uh, there's extensive literature on cancer therapy, and so we began uh, this, I'll show you some of the cell line data. So these are commercial pancreatic cancer cell lines, PANC1 and MIAPACA2. And you can see our C3 therapy really diminished the viability of the cancer cells. So here's our control with the good viability. Simvastatin alone in these two cell lines gave us some suppression. Digoxin surprisingly gave us quite a bit suppression. And then metformin gave us almost no suppression at all, but the three drugs together had a synergistic effect on the pancreatic cancer cell. Now I want you to remember, talking about personalized precision medicine, digoxin in these cancer cell lines had the majority of the effect. So just remember that. We then put those tumors in mice, and we treated the mice for three weeks, and our C3 therapy had remarkable suppression compared to the control group uh, of the human tumors in mice. We then were able to get human pancreatic cancer cell lines directly from patients out of Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, it took me two years to get those cell lines into the laboratory, and I want to thank Andrew Bianchin for, for sending them over. So we tested uh, patient-derived cell line 5 and 15. We have 16 of them, but we tested 5 and 15. So now you can see C3 is having a remarkable effect on these human pancreatic cancers directly out of patients. And in this case, simvastatin seemed to have the majority of the effect, whereas digoxin had very little effect, and neither did metformin. But once again, the three drugs together are synergistic in, in shutting down the viability of these patient-derived human pancreatic cancer cell lines. We put those cell lines into mice, uh, and we treated them for one month, and you could see that there was no growth at all uh, from the human pancreatic cancer cell lines treated with C3, the three drugs, versus the phosphate-buffered saline, which is the control. So this shows you uh, the tumor growing in mice that were uh, untreated, and these were the C3 treatments, and you can see uh, how much uh, relative light coming off of those, tu those tumors are. Now this was our most exciting. We then took the tumors out of the mice and started studying them. And so we studied uh, the expression of Burk 5 our target. So you can see in the untreated mice, the control group, you can see marked overexpression of Burk 5 in these human pancreatic cancers. And those that were treated had nearly complete suppression of our target. So that was very, very exciting data, that these three drugs uh, really knocked down our target. We, we then did some RNA sequencing and RNA expression, and we showed that, that the three drugs really knocked down BRK5 and top, ta top 2A, compared to simvastatin alone, metformin alone, and digoxin alone. So now we have some mechanism data of how this might be working. We also looked at the cell death genes, uh, DUSP15 in row B, and you can see that the C3 had a marked increase in cell death genes. So the three drugs were really increasing these uh, cell death genes. So then what we did is we did a, a big data analysis of the three drugs in patients. We looked at 2.5 million uh, ProMedica clinical database and we found 660 patients who are taking a statin, metformin, and digoxin for metabolic diseases like diabetes would be metformin, high cholesterol would be statin, and digoxin would be for some type of heart failure. And what we found out is the three drugs in this big data analysis had no toxic effect compared to taking one or two drugs. So these data support the hypothesis that simvastatin, metformin, and digoxin 
could be tested in a phase 1b clinical trial for patients with pancreatic cancer. So, we have targeted therapy for pancreatic cancer using a super promoter of the target gene, BRK5, um, identified repurposed generic FDA-approved drugs, simvastatin, metformin, and digoxin, and the FDA gave us an IND exemption in 2019. So the FDA gave us a green light to start a phase 1B trial. Um, so we began it in 2019, and we treated six patients, the pandemic hit, and all the clinical trials were stopped. It's still open and running, but in the six patients we treated, there was no evidence of any toxicity. Okay, so that's, um, that brings me to the conclusion, none of this work would be possible without a large team effort from multiple laboratories. So in my own laboratory is Dr. Liu, Robbie Sanchez, Dr. Yu, and Dr. Zhou did most of the work that you saw on those slides. The human genome work was done with Richard Gibbs and Marie-Claude Gingras at the Baylor College of Medicine, and the UCLA Clinical Exome Sequencing Center with Stan Nelson and Dr. Chen. And it was supported by NIH grants as well as foundation money from Jerry Moss. And so to conclude, uh, we think that the hypothesis now is to prove that a combination of generic drugs targeting actionable genes can treat pancreatic cancer and thus close the gap of cancer health disparities. Thank you. That was a very interesting presentation, and uh, uh, I'm sure just like uh, myself, you have some questions um, to ask, but we're going to save them until the end, uh, end of the session. So next we have um, another speaker who um, unfortunately wasn't able to join us in person, so she's going to do her presentation virtually, um, um, which I'm happy to hear um, because we definitely, uh, she's definitely a great um, speaker and presenter. Um, I'm, actually honored to pre I'm actually honored to introduce her because when I did this last year, I introduced my former postdoc advisor, uh, Dr. Channing Durr, who is considered one of the fathers of RAS, of Doncogene RAS, um, as it contributes to pancreatic cancer. And today I get to you know, introduce um, one of the mothers of, of RAS, <laughs> um, um, who's, who's done tremendous work on RAS involvement in pancreatic cancer. And so today I'm happy to introduce Dr. Daphna uh, Bargasagi. Um, she is uh, the Executive Vice President and Vice Dean for Science and the Chief Scientific Officer at New York University Grossman School of Medicine. Uh, she's a cancer biologist. Uh, she has undergraduate and master degrees from Berlin University from Israel. She has a PhD from SUNY at Stony Brook and did a postdoctoral fellowship uh, in the cell biology group at Cold Spring Harbor uh, Laboratory, not that far from here. And she is currently the Saul J. Farber Professor of Biochemistry and Molecular Pharmacology. Um, she, you know, again, is considered one of the mothers of RAS. Uh, she's done uh, you know, seminal research as it relates to studies involving uh, RAS in enhancing tumor cell fitness and you know, via immuno evasion and metabolism adaptation. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, and her talk, um, my talk today is Contextual determinants of pancreatic tumorinogenesis. So, without any further ado, let's give Dr. Basagi a big hand. Good morning, and hello to everyone. My apologies for not being able to be there. I really wanted to uh, be able to participate in person. Really, a, a wonderful symposium. I also probably would uh, would prefer to not to activate my video because uh, where I am, the Wi-Fi is very, very problematic. So um, I, I'm just, I was told before at a different meeting that I had, which actually prevented me from coming, that I'm cutting off. So if that's okay, I'm gonna get the video maybe for the uh, discussion session. 
so uh, as was introduced already, uh, a major focus of the work in my lab is uh, to identify key pathological drivers of cancers that harbor RAS mutations with the ultimate goal of using this information to devise new targeting strategies. Now, uh, most of our efforts have centered around pancreatic cancer. Uh, this audience does not have to be... Uh, Just give me a second, technology. Uh, this audience doesn't have to be reminded of the staggering statistics of this disease, probably has been covered already uh, today, but also because it is in fact a uh, poster child of uh, RAS driven uh, tumors, because 90% of these tumors indeed uh, have a KRAS mutation. And uh, it is worth noting also that this mutation uh, is, uh, uh, is acquired at a very early stage of the disease and using some very definitive and elegant mouse models uh, developed by uh, Dave Tuveson, our neighbor and, and leader in this disease, have shown unequivocally that this muta these mutations are critical both for disease initiation and uh, progression. So uh, the broad framework for what I'm going to share with you over the next uh, 25 minutes or so is based on um, a fundamental biological principle that tumors in essence uh, have properties of an ecological system in which the fitness of the neoplastic cell itself is continuously shaped and optimized by interactions with its environment. And from a host perspective, uh, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that this environment operates in uh, at different scales. And each of these scales uh, uh, is providing a somewhat different context contextual determinants, hence the title of the presentation. And those can be dynamically modified by these uh, cross-scale interactions. So what I wanted to do today is to share with you uh, some of our efforts to characterize these interactions really by way of demonstrating that examining the evolutionary trajectory of pancreatic tumors through these contextual lens can uncover some exciting and potentially important new questions and perhaps even offer new insight into actionable vulnerability. And given the time limitation, I thought I'll focus today on cross-scale interactions that involve the crosstalk between uh, the macrosystem and the uh, tumor cells. And this is an area I decided to focus on it because it is an area that is relatively poorly explored and uh, also is likely to have close links to the exosystem which is the focus of today's symposium, perhaps something that we can uh, get to talk to in the discussion. Now, uh, within uh, the macrosystem, the specific uh, determinant that we set up to explore is physical activity in the form of exercise. And this is really for uh, two reasons. The first, which is shown here and probably familiar to the audience, uh, exercise has been observed to reduce, in general, the risk of both cancer occurrence or uh, recurrence and uh, cancer mortality. But also, there have been uh, a number of fairly recent epidemiological studies uh, or observational studies that report improvement in disease control in pancreatic cancers. They're listed here. And although the underlying mechanism of these uh, studies are still largely unknown. It was a very courageous uh, MD-PhD student in uh, my lab, Emma Kurz, that decided to embark on the question of whether we can model the effect of uh, exercise on pancreatic tumor, and if so, 
uh, can we uh, leverage the information to at least begin to think how we can uh, how we can use this particular modality for uh, targeting this disease? So the experimental system that she established uh, involved orthotopic implantation of uh, KPC cells. So these are cells that are derived derived from a uh, genetically engineered mouse model that contains both KRAS mutation and p53 gain of function mutations. We isolate the cells and then we introduce them into uh, a syngenic to the pancreas of syngenic uh, animals. And then uh, MR had to set up uh, a mouse gym. And uh, this is what the gym looked like. As you can see, very nice uh, New York City skyline with uh, a view of the Empire State Building. And then uh, she used an, uh, an exercise regimen, aerobic exercise regimen that you can see uh, above uh, the, the mice running. And uh, the key thing here is that it's a mild, um, mild aerobic exercise. Uh, the speed at which the mice are running is about 3.5 miles per hour, uh, five times a week, 30 minutes a day. And it was designed purposefully uh, in this manner uh, to account for the fact that if we want to translate the information that we get into patients, um, Obviously, pancreatic cancer patients have uh, numerous comorbidities, and so the exercise regimen needs to be quite mild. So to start, Emma uh, used two uh, exercise regimen, one starting at uh, day one, post-op, and the other at day 12. And uh, in both scenarios, she uh, saw a reduction of 30% uh, in tumor weight, suggesting that aerobic exercise can provide a tumor protective effect in the setting of both pancreatic tumor initiation and progression. Now, interestingly, uh, this protective effect was lost in athymic mice or in RAG1 knockout mice, indicating a, an essential role for mature lymphocytes in this protective effect, which prompted us to perform a deep unbiased phenotyping of the effect of exercise on intratumoral immune milia using single cell RNA sequencing analysis. And so uh, this is the famous Disney plot that you get from an analysis like this. Uh, we saw a spectrum of immune cell types that are known to infiltrate a solid tumors. So that was technically reassuring. And then uh, the analysis itself revealed uh, two very striking phenotype, one which is expansion of a uh, T lymphocyte clusters and the other uh, contraction of myeloid-derived uh, suppressor cells and uh, neutrophils. Now, uh, we were particularly interested with uh, this cluster because of the fact that it was dependent on mature uh, T lymphocytes. And in subsequent analysis, what we have observed that indeed the vast majority of the expansion of this uh, particular cell population is associated with uh, effector CD8 uh, T cells. That was good on the computer, but it was also reassuring to see that we see the expansion of these uh, cells also in the uh, pancreata of the exercise animals. And then when we flow them, uh, we indeed uh, see that exercise is accompanied by an activated phenotype of these cells, which is shown here by activation markers of CD8 cells. So, um, it was important at this point before we move on to assess the translational relevance of this exercise immunity access. And to do that, we partnered uh, with Florencia McAllister for MD Anderson, uh, who provided us with surgical specimen and clinical data from patients who underwent aerobic exercise intervention concurrent with neoadjuvant therapy prior to resection. And remarkably, the picture that we saw in people was quite similar to what we observed in mice. What we saw was that um, 
what we saw was that uh, exercise was associated with an expansion of uh, these um, uh, CD8 cells, activated uh, CD8 cells, and also was accompanied by a significant increase in the median survival, as you can see here, uh, in the median overall survival in patients. So uh, these observations suggested to us that exercise can promote CD8 mediated immunity in human uh, pancreatic cancer. Next question was then where the CD8 cells are coming from? Uh, what exercise does that induces this expansion of this cell population? So a little primer on exercise physiology. Uh, it is fairly well established that exercise is associated with a sympathetic spike, and, uh, and this lead to the mobilization of specific subset of immune cells from the periphery to the circulation. The phenomenon, the phenomenon might be known to uh, some of you. It's called uh, exercise-induced leukocytosis. And it is thought to be mediated by epinephrine-dependent signaling uh, that in, in the leukocytes themselves, which induces their detachment from the vascular endothelium in the marginating pool and leading to their release to the circulation. So to test whether this is relevant to what we are seeing in our model system, uh, we use a, uh, first of all, we uh, looked at the uh, at the blood of these animals, and we show, we saw we saw both increase in epinephrine twenty minutes after uh, the finish of the exercise, and also an accumulation of CD8 cells in the circulation of these animals. Uh, in addition, uh, both. Uh, the tumor protective effects of the exercise, as you can see here, and the immune activation were uh, blocked uh, or were attenuated in the presence of uh, propanolol. So uh, this uh, suggested uh, that indeed the uh, CD8 cells are making their way into the tumors uh, through this phenomenon of mobilization from the circulation. All right, so now that we knew how the uh, cells are uh, finding themselves in the tumor bed, we wanted to understand the mechanism uh, that underlie the enrichment of their effector phenotype. And so to answer this question, uh, we first performed an IPA analysis. So this is a, uh, a pathway analysis. And what we found out is that uh, there is a significant enrichment of downstream responses to IL-15 signaling in these uh, tumor infiltrating CDA, CD8 cells uh, in the case of exercise. Now, we find this really very intriguing uh, because, uh, first of all, IL-15 is a myokine that is produced by contracting skeletal muscle during aerobic exercise, where it uh, predominantly acts to improve muscle glucose homeostasis and oxidative metabolism. But in addition, it plays a very important role and well-characterized role in the induction and maintenance of effector T-cell responses as part of inflammatory and protective immune responses to microbial infection. So uh, this prompted us to uh, try to validate the engagement of this signaling axis. Uh, and we did it first by uh, observing that there is a, a significant increase in, uh, uh, in the abundance of IL-15 receptor expressing CD8 cells in the tumor of the exercised mice. And uh, the, uh, these uh, particular uh, cells have, uh, are demonstrating, this cell population are demonstrating uh, an increase in uh, proliferation and in activation markers. Uh, now, uh, consistent uh, with the idea uh, that uh, this is really dependent on IL-15, what we find out, what we found out is that uh, uh, neutralization of IL-15 uh, abolished the tumor protective effect of uh, exercise, and. Um, 
consistent again with uh, the uh, involvement of the cell population or with the recruitment of the cell population uh, through EIL, uh, what we found out is that uh, propanolol is uh, inhibiting uh, the increase in this uh, cell population. Um, so, um, so this is what's happening in the periphery. And then we wanted to ask the question uh, whether IL-15 exists also in the tumor bed. And we can see the analysis here. What we found out is that both immune cells in the tumors and uh, non-immune cells are producing IL-15. So that creates a really interesting situation where perhaps the cell population is first generated in the periphery and then arriving into the tumor bed, and then in the tumor bed, it continues to be activated through these other sources of uh, uh, somewhat of a positive feedback um, mechanism. Uh, we wanted to then uh, investigate the uh, relevance of this axis, the IL-15, IL-15 receptor axis to human disease. And to do that, uh, we mined the TCGA uh, database and found that indeed, similarly to the observation in the mouse, IL-15 receptor expression is significantly correlated with markers of T-cell activation, including CD44, interferon gamma, uh, granzyme B, and uh, PD-1. Okay, so in the last few minutes, uh, I wanted to discuss uh, the translational opportunities because that's what we set out to do in the first place. So one of them, of course, would be to deploy immune, the immune activation benefits uh, conferred by exercise uh, by engaging pac patients in exercise regimen. Uh, this is a complex and challenging undertaking, but I believe truly that it's worth exploring and maybe something that we, again, can uh, come back to in the discussion session. But another approach would be, now that we know the mechanistic basis, at least in animals, uh, uh, for the protective effect of exercise, was to, uh, uh, to use pharmacological intervention strategies. And given that the tumor protective effect of IL-15, uh, of, um, of exercise, is dependent on IL-15, we thought that perhaps pharmacological activation of the IL-15 signaling axis could mimic the effect of exercise. So uh, we tested this idea by uh, using an IL-15 super agonist that was kindly provided to us by Novartis and found that indeed the treatment of mice with this uh, super agonist had a uh, tumor protective effect. This is the uh, regimen, the treatment regimen, and you can see a uh, reduction in uh, the tumor that is accompanied by an increase in this uh, alpha 15 receptor positive CD8 cells. This was again accompanied by an activation profile of these cells and by uh, improved uh, survival, uh, which um, suggested that uh, IL-15, the IL-15 axis uh, or activation of this axis uh, through this super agonist can be uh, used uh, to, uh, to, uh, to enhance uh, the uh, activity of this effector T cells. Now, not too surprisingly, when there is an activation of effector T cells, they also uh, become a little bit exhausted. And what you can see is that there is an upregulation of uh, PD-1 in these cells. And uh, that then uh, led to the idea that perhaps uh, the combination of IL-15 super agonists and PD-1 will be uh, even more protective in this setting. And this is the experiment that was done, a combination of anti-PD-1 and IL-15 super agonists and really uh, remarkable survival benefits under uh, these conditions. Uh, this uh, effect was observed also in the context of combination with uh, chemotherapy, uh, which um, um, not for the sake of time, uh, take my word for it. But most importantly, it, uh, it uh, led us then to propose uh, a phase 1B trial involving uh, this uh, combination. 
So, so here is the trial. Uh, the title is Evaluation of Mechanism and Efficacy of IL-15 Super Agonist-Based Neoadjuvant Chemoimmune Therapy for Pancreatic Cancer. It's a phase 1B uh, conducted uh, at this point in time at our medical center uh, and generously uh, supported by the Last Garden Foundation. It is scheduled to open in the next few months, and uh, we are really looking forward to, uh, to see the outcomes. So um, to uh, uh, summarize, what we found is that mild aerobic exercise has a uh, tumor protective effect, which is mediated by the concerted action of both systemic and local immunity. It is initiated uh, by exercise-induced adrenergic signaling, which promote the peripheral mobilization of immune cells, including this very unique uh, T-cell, CDA T-cell population that express the receptor on the cell surface. They're probably initi initially being expanded uh, and activated through the production of IL-15 uh, by the muscle. They end up in the circulation and then recruited into the tumor where they're continuously expanded and activated by the production of IL-15 in the tumor. And those are the, uh, the soldiers, if you will, that are responsible for the anti-tumor effect of exercise. This unique feature, as I already shared with you, can be leveraged therapeutically through the pharmacological activation of this axis. And so uh, just going back to this uh, multi-scale ecosystem paradigm that I introduced at the very beginning of my presentation, what I think our finding underscores is the importance of these long distance, what I like to call long distance tumor interactions as determinants of tumor cell fitness and uh, their associated vulnerabilities. So uh, before I move to the most important slide of the uh, presentation, which is the acknowledgement slide, uh, I thought I will provide you just with a sneak preview of some of the work that we have begun to pursue, trying to evaluate the potential impact of aerobic exercise on pancreatic, on pancreas cancer prevention. Everything that we talked about up until now is treatment, but the holy grail is going to be to prevent the disease from ever happening. Uh, I will qualify my, uh, my um, data here by saying that they are preliminary, but uh, they are sufficiently intriguing, at least I think, to share it with you. So we use two experimental angles to address this question. The first involves a, um, a generically engineered mouse model of pancreatic cancer in which the disease uh, occurs quite gradually because it contains only a mutation in KRAS. So uh, at the age of three months, which is uh, shown here, uh, these animals definitely display the initial signs of malignant trans transformation. Uh, it includes a fairly pronounced metaplasia and uh, also um, um, a loss of acinar parenchyma, and of course, uh, quite uh, profound uh, desmoplasia is indicated here by collagen deposition. In contrast, uh, these histopathological features uh, were significantly reduced uh, in animals that were exercised starting at two weeks old and continuing throughout the entire three months period, in the, 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 the entire uh, three months period, and you can just imagine uh, the, the stamina that it takes from postdocs and graduate students to run these animals for three months, five times a week. Suffice it to say, and I think that uh, most of you can detect the uh, dramatic uh, delay uh, in uh, the appearance of these pathobiological features of the, or pathohistological features in the parenchyma of these uh, animals, indicating that exercise could, uh, in fact, uh, prevent or delay disease initiation. Another experimental system uh, that uh, I think is also uh, providing us with some encouraging data to suggest that 
exercise could also work in a preventive mode is uh, the commonly used model for uh, pancreatitis, uh, a, a pathophysiology that, as many of you know, is associated with high risk for pancreatic cancer. Um, it involves the administration of uh, ceruline, which is a CCK analog, increases the pancreatic secretion of um, digesting, uh, digesting, blah, digestive enzymes. And uh, in, because of that, it leads to tissue damage and inflammation. So uh, you can, this is a normal pancreatic parenchyma. This is what happens. This, the, the protocol is uh, we exercise the animals uh, for 21 days. At 21 days, we come, we introduce, uh, we come in, we introduce uh, uh, ceruline for two days. We let them rest for one day and then we sacrifice the animals. This is the appearance of the uh, pancreata of uh, ceruline treated animals, the typical uh, metaplasia, edema, and uh, robust immune infiltrates. And this is what these uh, pancreas looks like uh, in uh, ceruline treated animals that have undergone exercise. So by and large, I mean, the, the asinar compartment looks quite normal. There is a real paucity, almost very difficult to identify immune cells. And there is a little bit of uh, residual um, edema. So uh, I think uh, this is uh, sufficient evidence for us now to really start to explore the mechanistic basis for this uh, preventive effect, hoping that the lesson that we learn can be implemented at least in populations that have high risk for pancreatic cancer. So now the most important uh, slide, of course, none of these uh, could have happened without uh, first and foremost members of uh, my lab that are uh, uh, listed here. As I pointed out, the work was uh, done, uh, was spearheaded by uh, Emma, who is back to the clinic now, but there were really a number of people uh, in the lab, uh, Carolina, Anthony, and Rafi, who were uh, extremely helpful in uh, going, uh, going through very laborious times of, of doing the experiment. Uh, collaborators within uh, NYU Langone Health, our members of our Pancreatic Cancer Center, I want to acknowledge Paul Oberstein, who is uh, my partner in uh, this uh, trial that we are embarking on, but also a pilot trial for exercise in the neoadjuvant uh, uh, setting for uh, pancreatic cancer patients. Uh, our colleagues from Rehab Medicine who are participating with it, uh, other uh, important contributors and uh, of course uh, uh, funding agencies. And for those of you who do not believe uh, yet in what uh, I told you about exercise, just by complete coincidence, two days ago, if you watch CNN at eight o'clock at night, there was, uh, there was this little piece uh, by uh, a saying uh, that a new study um, uh, says that uh, 11 minutes a day. So we just need uh, 11 minutes a day in order to reduce the risk of all of these diseases. So uh, I'll stop here. Again, thank you for allowing me to join you in a uh, less than perfect uh, setting. And I will probably uh, turn off my uh, sharing of the screen and maybe can uh, go back on video so that I can participate in the discussion. Let's give Dr. Barsargi a big hand. Thank you for that presentation. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and start our panel discussion um, for both of our great speakers. Um, I guess I'll just start with a quick question. Um, for um, Dr. Brunicardi. So I uh, just was curious um, for your cell line in vitro experiments and for your current, I guess, clinical trial um, study that you're going on, that you're using, that you're doing right now, um, 
how diverse, you know, did you use diverse cell lines, like African-American cell lines, or are there any African-American patients in your clinical trial study, knowing that we have this huge health disparity um, with pancreatic cancer in African-Americans? So I was just curious, um, the diversity of, of the cell lines are used. You know, I know you see you got some cell lines, from, I think, from Scotland, and then also your patients, were any of them um, from diverse backgrounds? So that's a great question. Um, the cell lines were from Scotland, so I don't know the diversity of those cell lines, but it's a great thing I need to find out. But I understand from Dr. Salafu that Cold Spring Harbor has pancreatic cancer cell lines from uh, diverse patients, so it would be interesting to continue treating them. The phase one trial was done on six patients in Toledo. So the majority of the patients were underrepresented in medicine. And we're trying to get the phase two trial started with Dr. Salafu. And we um, certainly, we will have great diversity in the phase two trial in which we will treat 25 patients. Okay, thank you. I want to open it up uh, for questions from the audience. I have one here. So uh, the regular drug like uh, m uh, uh, digoxin and uh, simvastatin are reducing the expression of the Burk-5, right? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. The sorry. overexpression of BIRC-5 is reduced by the metabolic genes, metabolic drugs, right? So... Uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, I you, still don't... You're understand. asking if the Burk-6-5 is, is in induced by it's, it's reduced by metabolic uh, drugs it's like simvastatin no, no burk 5 is suppressed by the three drugs and burk 5 is overexpressed in almost all cancers and there's no targeted therapy uh, for burk 5 yet there was a drug out of japan i think it was one yk155 and they got the phase two trials and it was too toxic so okay. it didn't go anywhere. So Burk 5 we think, is a very interesting target. The, the protein associated with Burk 5 is called Survivin. So you may know about Survivin overexpression. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Other questions? Yes, hi. If one is already taking those three uh, drugs, uh, simvastatin, metformin, and digoxin, could that be used as a, a way of preventing uh, the cancer? We hope so. Okay. That would be, it's going to take probably five to 20 years to figure all this out, but it reminds me of the HIV. So when I was an intern, we were looking at patients coming in with AIDS. This would have been 1980, 81, and it was a death sentence. And then they figured out if you put the three drugs together uh, for aid therapy, it became a chronic disease. So that's what we're hoping. And then if you know TV commercials, there's all this preventive uh, therapies using two or three drugs. Right. Uh, so we hope to emulate that using the combination. First, we have to prove that it really prolongs survival in pancreatic cancer patients, but we also have cell line data in triple negative breast cancer we have prostate, colorectal, and glioblastoma. So we have to start with pancreatic cancer and focus on that and go through a phase two, then maybe even a phase three trial. So this just takes a long time. But after that, yes, prevention. Thank uh, we you. know that patients who are on metformin alone have a lower incidence of pancreatic cancer. So that was in a large epidemiology study. They tried metformin alone in clinical trials on pancreatic cancer, and it had no effect by itself. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Um, I'm in the back of the auditorium. You won't be able to see me. But um, the uh, prevention data on the last slide is really uh, quite remarkable. When you look at the pancreata of these animals, do you have uh, tertiary lymphoid structures? Do you have any evidence that you're generating an immune response, for example, to KRAS, which is, you know, expressed aberrantly in so, those cells that could get to that? So have you, have you had a chance to use your triple yes, therapy on these mouse models that Daphne was talking about to see if they could prevent early pancreas cancer or have some impact on 
pancreatitis induced changes? No, we, we, it's a great idea. I loved her talk, but we, we have a tiny lab, and so we're fo you know, we just focus on what's the next step in the translation process. But it's a great question. Um, so I'd have to partner, you know, collaborate with some, someone like Daphne to, to do that study. And then Daphne, do you think the exercise is going to work for all sorts of cancers? I mean, you're focused on pancreas, but if you took the APC min mouse and put it on the NYU treadmill overlooking the uh, Empire State Building, do you think that uh. would... <laughs> Uh, oh, my she's good. She's good. gut feeling is she's good. She's no, good. and I'll tell you why, because uh, even for pancreatic cancer, and I'm not sure, Dave, whether we overlap in some of the presentations that I gave, just even the difference between the primary tumor and the liver mets in terms of the immune modulatory event that happened, not too surprisingly, in response to exercise, tells me that it's not going to be one size fits all. I think the commonality is going to be a very profound immune mobilizing effect. And the trick is going to be to parse out uh, who is the culprit? Who is the immune cell population? For example, in the liver, uh, when, when you see IL-15, the first thing that an immunologist is going to tell you is NK cells. Uh, no evidence whatsoever for NK cell involvement in the pancreas, but in the liver, uh, the soldiers are the NK cells. The good news is that it does affect uh, liver meds as well, but it's not the NK cells. I, so in, in the big picture, yes, but I think the devil, uh, as always is the case, is going to be in the details. Any other questions before we cut this off? So this will be the very last question. Thank you. Uh, this is for... Um either a researcher, but uh, regarding signs and symptoms of pancreatic cancer, does that vary depending on the site of the organ on which the uh, tumor originates? And did either of you, or particularly Dr. Bernacardi, did you find any sort of a variation in a response depending on the site of the organ um, that the tumor um, originated on? So your question is, does the response depend on the organ? With the, 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 the cancer? The, the, site, the site of the organ. So you're referring to like the head, body, or tail? Yeah, so, yeah, so for both researchers, in, in terms of your um, research, does it seem like it's dependent on the site of the organ in terms of your response? Yeah. Does it, does it matter what, if it's on the head, body, or tail in oh, terms, I, of, it, okay. in in terms of it working for your um, particular drug or um, therapy? We think the problem with the pancreas, it's all the way in the back. It's not hanging like col uh, the colon on a mesentery. It's very hard to get to, and we think by the time the tumor is big enough to cause symptoms, it's already uh, the horse is out of the barn. Um, it, it doesn't, in my knowledge, it doesn't matter if the tumor's in the head, the body, or the tail for the therapy that we're proposing. Um, if, if you can operate, that's the, the major treatment right now and then you would have adjuvant therapy on top of that. So, so if, the, if the tumor can be resected, we go ahead and do that. Um, at MD Anderson and also at Sloan Kettering, they treat the patients with chemo first and watch the response, and then they operate on them if they can operate. The problem is that's a small percentage of patients with pancreatic cancer, and so the majority of them, the horse is out of the barn by the time it's discovered. And that's also um, disparities of health. There's a lot of papers written on that, that the underserved populations aren't, um, aren't either getting to the surgeons or they're not, pick they're not being diagnosed in time. And so that contributes to the disparities of health. Dr. Barsargi, you want to say anything before we finish? Uh, yeah, so uh, the, the simple answer, yes, there is a big difference. So we are modeling these uh, both because the orthotopic model allows you to introduce the cells into the different parts of the pancreas. We can create head tumors and we can create tail tumors. Uh, the, um, 
initial immune modulatory effect of the tumor cells on the parenchyma are vastly different in these two locations. In the end, they catch up. So I think this will end up really being very important uh, to, uh, to consider in, uh, in prevention modality, uh, as, as was pointed out. Once the, uh, once the horse is out of the barn, when you have already a, 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 a mass that is, uh, is big enough, they're gonna be similar. But uh, the tumors in the head start off being very, very different. Not too surprisingly, because the tissue injury in the head probably is in part uh, mediated by what's coming from the bile duct, uh, the bile duct and uh, the gut. Awesome. Let's give both of our speakers a big hand. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Barsaragi. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Nicholas Robin. Uh, this is going to be an update to the Polytechnic 1000 New York Genome Project. Um, we were lucky. There were seven New York, New York Genome Project grants, and SUNY Downsville was lucky to be funded in two of those. So we are so happy with that. Um, he is a computational biologist. Um, right now, he works at, uh, Memorial, uh, at NYU Genome Center. Uh, he will give us an update on the program and where we are going. You have 10, 15 minutes. So th thanks a lot uh, to the organizer, Dr. Salifu, Dr. Tuvison, Dr. Martin Rulli. Thank you so much for inviting me, for giving an update. Um, so as I was introduced, I, am, I need to warn you, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a wet lab biologist, I'm a computational biologist. So on the uh, Grand Canyon between genomics and clinical care, I am very firmly on the genomic side of it, but I will argue that uh, we need to chart the genomic landscape very firmly in order to build a bridge uh, to clinical care, which, which is absolutely the goal of this project. Um, so uh, the, the project I will talk about uh, is called Polyethnic 1000. I'm at the New York Genome Center, and um, I will start, if I can, uh, just by a very technical slide to describe the pipeline that we have for tumor normal whole genome sequencing, but really to um, indicate that we are uh, characterizing all of the genomic mutations, both in the normal sample, but in, also in the tumor sample. So the single nucleotide variants, the short insertion and deletion, the structural variants, the copy number variants, everything that we can uh, obtain from the, uh, the, the genome of those tumors, we can get it through whole genome sequencing, which is different from other approaches as exome sequencing or panel sequencing. Um, we uh, have this pipeline, it's accessible in the cloud, it's applied to various uh, TCGA projects at the moment in various different cancer types, um, and uh, we can do a ton of analysis downstream of this pipeline and obtain all sorts of genomic information, and I will try to describe how that works for, for our project. So as uh, we all know in this room, we have a, gi a gigantic problem in cancer genomics that the main uh, database that we use to um, uh, interpret our results are so heavily biased uh, by ancestry. And so the TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas, that was initiated about 15 years ago, has about 80% of the patients are from European ancestry. Another uh, large um, uh, program called AACR Gini has a lot more patients, uh, but has the same, same problem. And that problem is not unique to cancer, it's in every genomic database. We have a, a, a large overrepresentation of patients of European ancestry. And um, we, we know that there is a ton of diversity, uh, a ton of disparities. Uh, we have discussed some of them this morning, and we know that a lot of them are coming, are, are associated with environment, with socioeconomical factors, with difference uh, in, in, in diet or other aspects of it. But we also know that there are some uh, molecular differences, and a typical example is uh, represented in this figure from the AACR report on cancer disparities last year. Uh, which tracks the frequency of EGFR mutation in lung cancer in different populations. And you can see that if we start in Africa, as we always should, uh, we have 10% of the patients have a mutation in EGFR, 
and we follow the, the path of human migration, we go to Asia and we have 50%. 50% of the patients with lung cancer have a mutation in EGFR. And then we go in the United States and we go back to between 10 and, and 12%. And, and in various uh, populations, we have a really large uh, difference in the frequency of that particular gene. And so that there, there are differences in smoking habit, there are differences in environment, but there is really a molecular difference here that we try to, we would be interested in understanding. So uh, we live in New York. Uh, we're very proud of the uh, large uh, uh, ethnic and racial disparity that is summarized on this plot uh, coming from the census in 2010. Um, I will argue that this plot shows the disparity in New York, but more importantly shows the segregation in New York. And we see that we have a lot of uh, differences between neighborhoods in New York. So the green dots here correspond to, uh, to white uh, um, inhabitant of New York. Uh, orange dots correspond to Hispanic, uh, red dots to Asian, and uh, the blue dots correspond to the, to the black, uh, and that's all by self-declaration during the census in 2010. So we assemble a, collect, a collaborative network of institutions really trying to uh, recruit patients uh, outside of the uh, typical uh, institution we work with typically in Manhattan, and we really try to work with a, with a lot more uh, institution. So, uh, in 2019, and I presented this, uh, this slide in the past, uh, we, have, we had a pilot phase, what we call a phase one, where we collected 160 tumor samples. We performed exome sequencing and RNA sequencing. And uh, this uh, 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 slide here represents the genetic ancestry information that we can extract from those uh, samples. So the top track corresponds to the self-declaration, how people uh, arrive at the hospital and declared uh, their uh, race or ethnicity. And uh, we can infer, we can estimate their uh, continental ancestry on the middle track, um, with orange being the, the African genome. And you see that people that self-declare as African-American uh, would have a very variable uh, amount or, or proportion of their genome uh, that we can associate with the African continent. Uh, we also had a large number of uh, East Asian samples or, or patients in, in this cohort, as well as some uh, uh, Latino uh, sample. The, the, the uh, lower track correspond to the uh, population level. So we use a large consortium called the Southern Genome Project uh, that had a number of uh, reference population, and we can estimate the proportion of the genome for each of those patients that associate uh, with some of those reference population. And you can see that even between patients that are self-declared as African-American, they have a variable proportion of their genome corresponding to the African genome, but also that uh, these genomes comes from different reference population. And so there is a ton of genetic diversity within Africa that we can uh, study through this lens um, and, we, and we can uh, estimate by the, the methods that we have implemented. That uh, project was described in a small essay, essay that we wrote last year, uh, but we then embarked on the second phase um, of the project that we are currently in, where we assembled a budget for tumor normal whole genome sequencing, tumor RNA-seq, and we have about uh, the, the, the budget for about 1,000 uh, retrospective and prospective samples. We had a review board that scored all those different applications, and as was uh, said before, two of them uh, were, were allocated to projects uh, where SUNY Downstate is involved. And um, so uh, here is the, the, the project, I think, sorry, um, no. Okay, so uh, where we are now, we have um, uh, started to receive samples in October 2021. We now have uh, 546 samples that are fully sequenced, assembled, analyzed, and, um, and, and as you can see, there, there are two lines because there are some samples that we receive and that failed QC and that you know, we, we didn't uh, include in our cohort. Um, but we're really progressing and uh, we hope to get closer to our target goal uh, by, by the, the midpoint of this year. Um, so here is the summary of the genetic ancestry. We, as I, again, it's the same color code as the previous slide. We have a lot more samples and it's separated by the different uh, cancer project that we have so far. So on the uh, far uh, left of this slide, we have the few samples for the bladder cancer cohort, then the breast cancer cohort, the colon cancer uh, project that I will describe in a little bit more details, lung cancer, multiple myeloma, and on the right, the prostate cancer cohort. So the, uh, the difference here between those samples is the middle one, the lung cancer project, which is the only project that we build to study East Asians and uh, white patients in New York. And the main reason for it is that we are studying pre-malignant tumors uh, for lung cancer, uh, for which we didn't have an existing cohort that we can refer to. 
All the other ones, as you can see, have a large proportion of their, uh, the, the cohort uh, for patients of Europe or, or African American. Uh, the multiple myeloma, for instance, has a lot of uh, Latino uh, patients in the cohort. One of the reasons being that the, the uh, investigators involved in that project moved from New York to Miami, and that's actually where they're recruiting a lot of their samples right now. So um, when we run our entire pipeline for uh, a tumor normal whole genome, we can assemble all of the single nucleotide variants that we obtain, and we can deconvolve this signal into what we call the mutational signatures that are associated with particular processes that led to those uh, mutations. And so that's summarized here at the bottom track, the single nucleotide, then the double base substitution and the insertion and deletion, all of those colors correspond to a different signature, and a lot of those signatures are associated with a known uh, process that we can track. It's sorted by these uh, red bars, correspond to the SBS1, these first signatures that we know is associated with aging, but we can see that um, there is different processes occurring in those different cancer types. We knew that before, we recapitulate that, and um, we are going to study that in more details. We're going to associate that with the ancestry uh, information and with all of the different information that we're going to capture uh, in, in this project. So right now, we don't observe a particular signature that would be different between our cohort from a different, uh, different origin and the existing knowledge um, and the existing cohort in public database. But that's exactly what, what we are looking for. So a little bit more detail on the, the colon cancer project uh, led by, uh, le or led really at, at Cosmic Harbor, uh, SUNY Down State, and, and North Wales. Um, so we currently have 49 samples that are represented here. As you can see, majority of them are African-American samples. A few of them are East Asians. A few of them are, are European patients. And uh, when we look at the signatures, we uh, sorted all of those samples by the tumor mutation burden, by the number of mutations that we observe in the samples. So you can see on the right that you have the samples that are heavily mutated and that are all corresponding to microsatellite instability, and you observe the signatures that are associated with, mismatch rep or with, with DNA mismatch repair, ID2, DBS7, SBS44, 26, and 6. All of those are known to be associated uh, with DNA repair uh, deficiency, and, and that's what we see. But even between those, they are called MSI high, but you see that the signatures are slightly different. And so they can come with a different uh, type of mutations, a different source of the mismatch repair, and, and those are also all going to be interesting um, signal to track and, and to, to follow up. Uh, we also look at the uh, recurrent mutation in a plot that we call an oncoprint. The main uh, genes that we know are mutated in colon cancer are also found in, in our cohort. And then we took the RNA seq samples and we deconvolved the immune, uh, the immune system or the immune cell population. And you can see here that there is quite a number, uh, quite a, a variability between those samples. Some of them have a lot of macrophage uh, infiltration. Some of them don't. And so again, that's another type of. Uh, variability that we have in our cohort that we will uh, try to associate with uh, clinical information, with ancestry information, with mutation information. And so uh, that's, that's really the ongoing work. Um, so where we are now, uh, we need to complete the sample collection. We need to analyze both the clinical and the, and, and the genomic information. We will share all of the uh, genomic information and all of the data in a, a platform called ICGC Argo, and we will hopefully publish many uh, Polyethnic 1000 papers. Uh, you can see here the two ethnicity and cancer scholars from the New York Genome Center, uh, Onye Balogun and Melissa Davis, who just arrived in this auditorium. Um, to pre they presented a very nice poster uh, a couple of months ago. Um, we have uh, starting to have some, some uh. other posters from other projects that are uh, presented, and uh, we hope to expand this project uh, in future phases by uh, having more samples for those cohorts, add additional cancer type, add more population, uh, and, and really uh, have a lot more effort in uh, patient and community outreach. So uh, to go back to the uh, AACR report on cancer health disparities, there are multiple source of disparities. We are really focusing on, on, on the main or on the one that uh, we can tackle at the Genome Center on the biological part of it, um, but we hope that will uh, play a role in a better understanding and a better mapping of all of those disparity. Um, and so we know we can sequence and analyze uh, whole genomes uh, and RNA-seq, but uh, we really want to engage in a discussion on what else we can uh, do, uh, with whom, and for whom. 
And so um, I'm looking forward for the, the discussion after my presentation. Um, so I have a lot of people to uh, acknowledge and to thank, in particular the patients and participants to this uh, project, uh, but everybody else who played a role in uh, building the project, in analyzing the data. Um, Dave Tuveson was uh, really uh, leading this effort from the very beginning, uh, and he's part of our steering committee, uh, and, a, and a lot of support from uh, various uh, donors and organizations and institutions. Thank you very much for your attention and for inviting me. And just to here and take a question or two, we have some little time. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation, uh, wonderful effort. This is the reason why we are here today, right? We have to collaborate and then move the science forward so that we can better understand what is going on. So these contributions of samples, especially from the minority populations, is so critical. It's so important that we are able to do that so that we can contribute to the science. That will then explain why there are differences and how we can mitigate those differences. So thank you for those efforts. Any questions? Uh, thank you for this presentation. I really appreciate uh, the acknowledgement of the need for more diversity within genomic studies, as well as your thoughts and considerations around inclusion of uh, social determinants of health and what can be done in, in, in being able to bridge some of these areas of research to advance cancer disparities. My question is around whether um, you, you, earlier in your presentation, you talked about New York City being uh, diverse but also segregated, and to your point, there may be an opportunity to be able to look at uh, some of the structural and environmental factors that are impacting uh, cancer health disparities in conjunction with uh, the genomic and ancestry data. And so are there any, is there geocoding that is being done for the tumor samples and there are, are there opportunities to be yeah. able to look at geocoding to be able to incorporate um, some of the environmental determinants? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, that great question. Um, uh, there is a lot of active discussion on how to, uh, how to do it as best as we can with the samples we have currently. Um, so we would love to do a lot more of that. Um, we are, uh, depending on the project, depending on the samples, some of them can be recontacted, some of them can be uh, located precisely. Uh, we try to obtain, uh, we try, to, we try to, um, uh, to do it, but a little bit retrospectively. Not because it's an afterthought, but because you know, we, we needed to have um, what we can do with the samples we have. Uh, but very clearly, that is going to be front and center for future phase of the project. Um, so at the moment, uh, th there, are, there are some limitations in what we can do. And I, I think even if we were able to have the, let's say, the location of the patients at the moment of the, their diagnosis, it would not recapitulate all of their environment of the environmental exposure of the, during their lifetime, right? So it would be a good start to say, you know, we know where people live. Uh, at the moment, we really know where people are uh, diagnosed, um, and, and that, that's a sort of a proxy, but there is a lot more to do, and, and you know, New York is a you know, large city where we would need to sequence everybody, uh, and then we would also need to do similar projects in other cities and in other countries to really disentangle what is uh, related to genetic ancestry or to the environment. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's give an applause to him for the update.